no confidence in the House of Commons thanks to support from the Liberals. Without any Liberals voted in support of the government after a deal was made between private... Oh, don't worry about the plates, love. I'll do that. Um, but, listen, would you mind doing the lawn for me before you go? Yeah, of course. I can never get those nice straight lines like you. Well, you just got to fix your eye on a point in the distance. Oh, I know. That's what your dad used to say. The magnolia's got a bit wild, too. <gasps> Can't believe it's almost summer again. Yeah, it's coming around fast, isn't it? It's been a funny old year. You've been through a lot. It feels just like yesterday he was here with us. And also a lifetime ago. Time moves in strange ways, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, Mum, do you remember when we talked about you taking a little holiday? You know, like a change of scenery. Oh, <laughs> you and your ideas. Well, what is it this time? The Isle of Wight? Norfolk Broads? <laughs> well, actually, Bologna. I came across this residential cookery course. Bologna? France? Oh, my. And since when did we become so posh? Italy, Mum. And it's not about being posh, it's about you taking some time for yourself, you know, experiencing something new. You can learn to make fresh pasta, like real tiramisu. Oh, I don't need to go to Italy for that. I'll have you know, I picked up some chicken Kievs from Marks and Spencer's just last week. Well, exactly, Mum. You love cooking. This would be perfect. Think about all the stories you bring back. Not just recipes, but memories. New memories, happy ones. I've never even been on a plane, let alone out of the country. What would the neighbours say? Me jetting off to Italy, all on my tod. <laughs> well, they'd probably say, good for Sharon. And anyway, who cares what they think? You deserve a bit of joy. Especially after Dad. Oh, Brian. <laughs> well, you know, he said Italy was nothing but oily food and mafia and chaos. <laughs> yeah, your father, bless him, never was one for abroad. He felt there was more than enough beauty in England. Listen, Dad was Dad. We all loved him to pieces, but we had some pretty old-fashioned views. Besides, we're all Europeans now, Mum. Roy Jenkins said that we could all... Oh, for goodness sake, Martin, what Roy Jenkins this, Jim Callaghan that, you and your politics. (laughs) Yeah, all right, all right. But this isn't about politics. It'll be good for you. It'll be an adventure. An adventure? At my age? Oh, you do make me chuckle. (laughs) Give it a bit of thought, Mum. That's all I ask. Dad wasn't right about everything, you know? Yeah, I know. I'll mull it over. Right, but no promises. Run, fucking run, there's a monster, fucking run. Behind you, you hear this bounding of hooves on stone. Could you run for it? And suddenly she's gone. All that's in her mind is just get back to safety, get back to where she's staying, get back to her stuff. Stood around this little shrine waiting for you, the confraternita. We are uh, short of one to complete our task. I'm not having anything to do with no magic. Why are you talking to a dead man, I said so? I would take the trowel. And I would stab my palms in a stigmata. And then I would grab the, the dog-headed symbol. And you're reciting it pretty fluently. We must draw a cup of the Orcolat's blood. Sorry, old China. And I, I cut him. Thick, black, oozing substance begins to sort of trickle into this cup. For now, she runs down the hill into the night. Your hand, there. When the time comes. See. You watch for the sign. Hanging on the end of these chains that are suspended from the ceiling are corpses in various stages of putrefaction. On the end of the last chain is Julia.
The Apocalypse Players present Il Portico di San Luca A Call of Cthulhu Scenario by Dan Wheeler With Dominic Allen as Robert Hyde, retired chemist Joseph Chance as Nicholas Devere, theatre critic Perennial guest star Jeannie Spark as Sharon Clifford, widowed housewife And Dan Wheeler as your keeper of arcane lore The Feast of the Ascension The brothers are, are passing through this room to, towards a door each but I don't know whether you, uh, whether you uh, do anything I think I do check my, my progress and there's that sort of instinct to go to say Julia, Julia but I, but I think for, for once Devere claps a hand over his mouth and sort of goes... Mm. Mm. And sort of that that instinct to come because I don't quite know how this is going to work except for this. I, I'm primed, right? I'm primed, and I'm. I think if it's all right with you, I don't think I would say anything to her, but I can see her moving. Is that what you said? You can't see her moving. She looks still, but she. That's me projecting that I'm hoping she might still be breathing. She might be. She doesn't certainly. Oh, no, you said she wasn't hooked. Butcher hooked. She's not hooked in the way that the other corpses are. She's bound, which perhaps suggests to you that she is not dead. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Good, good clue. Christ, Christ. I think, I think I've got to carry on with what I'm doing. Because, you know, the ritual is everything. I think, I think you better, I think you better give me a, I think you better give me a sanity roll. Yes, yes, that's a sanity roll. Of course that's a sanity roll. <laughs> I think it's in, in this moment I realise that I care about Julia. I, I didn't realise that I cared about her. But, you know, I perhaps I have little fragments of memory of it's so nice to see two, peop- two people in love, two young people in love, and all, all of the stuff that I sacrificed to have my career is at stake in her, and it's an astonishing zero eight. Wow. On, I mean, it's, I've been feast or famine with my roles, with a couple of weird 50s. Wow. So no sanity loss for, for the sight of these corpses. I think unexpected for all of us. Yeah. <laughs> Perhaps it is the sense of ritual. Perhaps it is that sense of final, finally, I'm on stage. <laughs> so egotistical. But, you know, there's that sense of, I've been watching all these plays and I've been missing things this whole time that I'm here, but this this astonishing supernatural drama is now playing out. Yeah. And I am part of it. Yeah. And so there's that moment of wanting to improvise and sort of break out, and I resist it, and I and I think I I look at her, and and I I think I redouble my efforts to get to where the um I want to call them the brother. Is that okay? Is that what I, that's what they are? The brother. Yeah, I've been I've been referring to them as the brothers. Yeah. The brother told me to go, but I do cast several backwards glances at her and several attempts at just her rather than looking at any of the other. Putrefa- putrefying antipasty. Well, may- maybe you. In, in which case, maybe you should give me a spot hidden to see whether you can notice anything else about her. Hmm. Oh, yes, I'll take that. Well, that's a forty-six. Gosh, this, this is an exciting sequence of rolls. On my sixty spot hidden, so yep. Not a hard. You're pretty sure you can see movement as if she's breathing. Oh, thank God! I think I whisper under m- under my breath. Not that I ever really got to meet her properly, but I mean, there was that awful moment of her crossing and then just disappearing in the square, and I think it's been haunting me. Mm. There's the vain hope that Sharon got away. I mean, which is such a long shot. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure she's going to be dead. But, and I'm pretty sure I'm going to die now, but if we could do something to help this, but then maybe I'm helping her die. I don't know what I'm doing. No, no. You're just playing your role. I don't know what I'm doing. Robert, or Sol, uh, you see this too, but I'm not sure you can make it out in quite so much detail. You're looking down, so I don't think you can tell from up here that Julia is one of the bodies. Right. Presumably you've seen dead bodies before? Oh, yes. Yeah. (laughs) I've come across a few. (laughs) 
<laughs> I thought that was the case. <laughs> in which case, I will let you forego a sanity roll. I was in the war, remember? <laughs> I'm sure that's what it was. That's, that, that's the reason. <laughs> that's definitely the reason. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, well, <laughs> we'll let you forego a sanity roll for this. Excellent. So basically, you're as you sort of look across at the uh, the brother as he's carefully sort of, you know, laying out the paraphernalia with the cup mm. and things, it's all very quiet and still up there. Your last bout of madness has passed, but I think maybe just the, the shock of being in this situation brings Kevin's voice back, sort of ringing in your ears. What do you make of that down there, So That's quite a sight, isn't it? Bring back some memories, does it? Listen, Kev, I never told you what I experienced in that that south of Italy when we had mud um, up to our up to our knees. You know, it was it wasn't easy going. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm sure you had a very hard time. So, did that justify your actions? Does it? I've told you before, Kev. I told you before, I had to do what I had to do. Right. You'd have done the same if, if I was in the way, you know? I always told you, Kev, not to get in the way. Is that so? You're playing with the big boys now, you see? You've got to be careful. Well, maybe you ought to uh, take your own advice, or maybe you ought to just uh, stay out of the way of this business, right? Keep your back to the wall? Yeah. I'm not sure there's going to be many ways out, though. I think there's only one way out for you, Solomon Beckman. Anyway, have a nice evening. Well, I'll see you soon enough, Kev. Oh, yeah. I have a feeling we're going to be ending up in the same place. Oh, yeah. Uh, I think that's for sure. So, Joseph... You pass across this room, like down to the middle and sort of up the other side, and you go past this hole in the centre, and now you can judge that it's probably... It's really quite big. It's probably at least six feet across, this hole in the centre. Jesus. But is it formalised, or is it just a rough hole, or is it... it, It's formalised, but it doesn't have, like, a sort of built-up well around it, if that makes sense. It's just a hole in the floor, but it is it is formalised. And um, the brothers show you to um, one of the one of the doors, and uh, as as you pass, he also points up towards the ceiling where you see see another hole, right up in the ceiling, directly above this hole in the floor. Mm. And he says he points at this and he says, "Watch out for the sign. Watch out for the sign. The sign." Yes. See. And then he he leads you to another door and shows you and you see another symbol, just like the one on the on the first door. It's kind of like an egg shape with um with three crooked lines coming off it that almost look like sickles. And it's it's carved very formally into the keystone of the door. And he points at it again. And then he points to like an alcove just next to the door and indicates for you to stand in it. It's like a sen- like a sentry post. Mm. Almost, almost like you'd put a statue there. Mm, yeah, very much so. Almost like, like a saint above the door of a cathedral. You know, it's that kind of... At last. At last. Mother would be so proud. Wouldn't she? And did you step into it? Um, I think there is that moment of hesitation. But I say, see... See, and then I finally do step into it with this, I, like without being sick or shitting myself. <laughs> and I was like, "Oh God, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do. Apparently, I'm going to do this." But yeah, I think I'm in now. I mean, like, there's no way I can back out in this stage. Yeah. So you step into your alcove, and he he sort of gives you a gentle push on the chest, so you take a little step back, perhaps, and you realise that you're incredibly well hidden here, with your grime on your face and your black cloak and this little sentry alcove but it feels very much like an upright coffin and there you wait so Sharon you 
have uh, you made it to the bottom of the hill. Yeah. It you know would have maybe maybe taken you a couple of hours to walk, but I think in in less than an hour you've you've made it. You probably haven't stopped running the whole time. Yeah. And you arrive back into into town really through um through the I think it's the Porta Sa- Saragossa possibly. Oh, I'll fix that in the edit. But basically the the port the the arch that begins the portico up to the basilica. Yeah. Okay. And you can see the crowd gathered here, and you can see uh, a few members of the Brotherhood holding the this this idol on top of a, a staff mm-hmm. as if they're ready to set off on the on the procession mm-hmm. and I, I i don't know whether you're heading are you heading straight back into the center of town where, where are you going i want to get i want to get back to safety i want to get back to the casa i'm gonna just i'm just gonna head back okay great great you start weaving through the streets it's pretty chaotic groups of people kind of basically heading the way that you're coming in yeah 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 people out partying in the streets drinking in the in the streets it's like a really twisted notting hill festival and you're just you're just trying to get out and everyone's having a good time yeah yeah i think you feel like you're in some kind of fever dream really yeah <laughs> because you probably don't know what you've just experienced or or why you or even really why you left did you see what you you think you saw and I imagine you're exhausted. Yeah. So yeah, you you weave your way through the crowds, busier and busier as you get towards the centre, pass through the um, Piazza Maggiore, and mm-hmm. and make your way back to the Casa Petronio. Mm-hmm. What do you, what do you do when you get there? Burst through the door if I can. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Burst through the door. Slump back against it shut the door, slump down on the floor and just start to cry <laughs> I think mm, mm. sheer, exhausted, weeping sobs okay and maybe you're there maybe you stay there for some time oh I think quite some time <laughs> yeah and at some point you hear the you hear the, the clock chime 12 you sort of hear a cheer go up and you're aware that the procession has started. Oh my gosh, yeah. And they're making their way back up to where maybe you left your companions behind. Mm-hmm. But it all seems like a strange dream now. Yeah, yeah. And do you eventually sort of crawl back to your room and get into bed or...? Yes, crawl to room. Not get in bed, though. Fine. Because Sharon is, above all things, a practical beast. Yeah. So I think it's cruel to room, shove everything that she can find into her into her suitcase. Right, yeah. And she drags her suitcase down the stairs, and I think she... Her thought in her mind is just, get out of here, get out of here, get out of here. So with her, with her last strength, she's going to try and find a taxi to take her to the airport. Right, okay. That night, like this, you know, early hours of the morning. Right now, right now. Not hanging around, getting out of here. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> okay, so you do. Uh, I think you eventually manage to flag down the taxi and get in it and and make your way out to the airport. Amazing. And as you drive out and you you drive out of the city and you see the the crowd sort of moving up the the, the portico. Yes, the lights. Yeah, you can see the torches on the hillside charting the way up. Oh God. <laughs> the taxi heads out and maybe you could give me a power roll yeah that's a 61 on a 70 oh just snuck in yep I think there's something about where you've been the amount of time you've spent underground and the way it reminded you of um, of Brian and his time he spent digging tunnels secret tunnels yeah you feel this connection, and as you see this crowd moving up the portico, you have this awareness that you can't, you just can't put your finger on where it comes from, but I think you're aware that there's something moving in the same direction, but underneath the ground, moving up towards the basilica. Whoa. <laughs> oh, great. That's great. Joseph, mm. 
you've been waiting now for some time in this little stone sentry coffin, whatever you want to call it. Yes. Uh, when you hear them, you don't need to give me a, a listen roll. It's never a good sign. You begin to hear this glibbering and chittering and meeping noise. We don't like meeping, do we? No, we don't. Mm. And scampering footsteps. It's hard to tell because of where you are and the way the sound waves are sort of blocked because your little sentry hut is so small. It's hard to know where these noises are coming from. But they're getting louder. Yes. And there's something excitable about the noises. Did you did you hear any of the noises when um, Sharon leaned into the well and you, you leaned down and listened? Did you hear anything as well? Was it just Sharon? I think I, I, think I saw the claw marks. Hmm. I don't think I ever heard the noises, but but there was a discussion about what they were, and she did say that she heard something. I just, yeah, that sounds that sounds right to me. Didn't she, didn't she say? Did you hear that? Well, don't listen now, she said. No. Don't listen now. <laughs> that doesn't quite work, does it? It's excellent. Uh, well, suffice to say, you've never heard anything quite like this before. Yeah, meeping. I don't like the word meeping. Yeah, it's a word that sort of comes into your head. You 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 don't know how to scri- describe this noise, and you just it's it's like a meeping noise. Yeah, I mean it's an excellent word, but I'm distressed in an upright coffin. I'm distressed to hear any form of meeping. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And the noise gets louder, and then you become aware that whatever they are are in the in the space. <sighs> In, in the cavern, which is um, just beyond your archway. I, I don't know whether you attempted to take a look. Ooh. I mean, uh, is it sort of inevitable that there will be progress across in front? Well, I don't know that, do I? Well, I, I don't think that has happened yet. Yet. <laughs> I mean, maybe perhaps it's a... Tell me this. Are you trying to resist the temptation to look? Do you think... I, th- I think there is a moment of hesitation. There's... I know I've just already said that in my own way, but I think this is a different kind. So the, the, the description of the sound being so sort of not what I was expecting mm. strips me of my confidence. Mm-hmm. And it's a little bit like that moment where you're waiting for the dentist and the dentist sits you down and the drill starts and you're going, I can do this, I can do this. And then you hear it in your own mouth and then everything changes and you go, oh, actually, I really don't know if I have the confidence that I thought I had. But I am a critic and I do want to see the show. Well, I think perhaps as all these sort of thoughts come through your mind and you, you sort of hesitate and think, should I, should I, shouldn't I? I'm stalling then. Suddenly... A figure passes right in front of you down your little corridor. Oh, I see. Never hesitate. And this figure that sort of shuffles past is uh, is a humanoid figure, but with an incredibly canine face. Oh, of course it is. It looks very much like um, um, what you what you saw of Niccolo's mother, oh. but more animal, less human, if that makes sense. Yeah, you're, unfortunately, yes. More stooped. The spine is protrudes more from the back. Bestial. The face is, comes to more of a point. Oh. And it comes right past and you can hear it. <laughs> Sniffing. And I guess you're thinking, like... How, how, how well hidden am I? How how well protected am I in this little alcove? I mean, yeah. And also, can I hear? Can I hear the brothers at all? Or are they? No. No. Oh, so no one started yet. Oh, God. oh, right. No one started yet. But this figure passes you, and passes into the cavern. Whoa! Whoa! Wow! <laughs> are you? Are you gonna? I mean, obviously, I've seen feet. Does that... Oh, well, you saw... You saw... Hmm. Yeah, this is a question. I, I, you're, you're, you're somewhat... Prote- and, and now I realise perhaps you are the only person who could have done this because you're the only person who has maybe been a little bit inoculated against 
these creatures by having seen one before. But maybe you should... Do you feel like you need to give me a sanity roll for this? Do you feel like this is... I just, I think, I think what you just described is, is like the full... I, I, because I have that sense of the description of Signora Fabri, mm. that, sh- that sh- there was something, either there was a change that was, I mean, I was thinking gargoyle, you see, at that time, and I was thinking, she's some kind of weird, angelic or demonic figure. Yeah. But now I've actually seen one, and it's not what I was expecting, but it's fuller, and I, and I think I'm describing it as one, so I was thinking, she's in a transformation process, or she's part of this, she's a hybrid, who's always been like this or something. I don't know. So now I think I think unfortunately that is okay. That is a sanity roll for him. Okay, you can give me a sanity roll, but because he's answering answering his questions. Yes, I was. T- I'm tempted to give you. I'm tempted to give you a, a bonus die because of what you've seen before. But no, I think no. I think uh, give me a give me a straight roll. But it might affect what it might affect what the damage is. Straight roll. Straight roll. Fifty eight. I've rolled a fifty eight on my sound there, so it's close. Very close. But it's a pass. So it's a pass. It is a pass. It's it's not by much. Okay. Well, I'm going to say you don't lose any sanity. That's that's my um, that's my concession to the fact that you've you've seen one before. Ah, oh, thank you. Yes. No, I appreciate that. If this was your first, I think I maybe still would have taken a point. But maybe you maybe you do justify it to yourself somehow by saying perhaps it's a condition. Perhaps it is a strange medical condition that some of the people in the city share and, and actually that makes sense of the fact that yeah there's some lunatic reasoning going on there isn't there yeah 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 for sure I buy that. but after some time you, you kind of just get the sense that anyone anyone who would be here is here if that makes sense mm. and you realize that of course you should be waiting for a sign so i think you do eventually step out of your alcove oh gosh it would be that awful moment but yes i would i'd i'd risk it yeah. And as you look through the the archway, you see many, maybe a maybe a dozen or more, maybe a couple of dozen of these creatures. Oh dear. Oh my goodness. Almost human, but with very canine faces. <gasps> but their focus is very much on the corpses that are suspended. Maybe they've managed to get hold of of one of them and a sort of um, ripping, tearing it, and they, they're, they're, feast, they're feasting on what they can get hold of. Uh. <sighs> Messy mouths right right into the sort of rubbery, rotten yeah. Yeah. carcass of whatever poor, poor person this was. But, but some, some of them are trying to reach the other ones. You can see some are maybe trying to reach the, the slightly fresher corpses, and there's certainly one or two that are really interested in Julia. Oh God! Uh, and amongst them, as you as you as you look out and watch, you you notice that they are different. Most of them are naked and hairless. Uh, amongst them, though, you catch a glimpse of some that look like m- more human than others. Uh, maybe they still have some hair, maybe some items of clothing, and one of them is Gabriella Fabri. Dom, you uh, you see all this too, and although from your vantage point you don't have quite the same view as Joseph, I think unfortunately this probably still does warrant a sanity roll from you. Yeah, the dead bodies themselves aren't a problem, but I think uh, with all this weird shit going on now with monsters trying to eat them, I think that's a sanity roll. <laughs> I think it is. What do you know? 84 on a 21. <laughs> okay. So that, because you're indefinitely insane, that's a, that's yeah. a bad net. How much do I lose? Let's find out. <laughs> Amazingly, it's just one point of sanity. Hmm. That was on a D6. But it doesn't really make a lot of difference, does it? Let me find out what's going to happen to you, because I can, I can summarise it, because you're on your own, effectively. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great, great. Uh, so I'll come back to you, Robert. Joseph, at this exact moment, as you're sort of wrapped, really, by by these 
this horrible scene unfolding before you. And there's quite a chorus in front of me, isn't it? Yeah. Could you just give me a spot hidden to see if you notice something else? Yes. Of course. That is a 44. It's all very middling at the moment for me. 44. Well, I mean, as long as it's a pass. Perfect. On a 60. Yep. Another, another. Fantastic. You see a glint coming from this, from coming from this hole in the ceiling. As if someone has, um, flashed a light on a mirror or something. And then you see it again. It's a very clear sign. Ah. Oh, that is, ah, yes. Good. Yeah, I, I, for some reason there's a sort of flashing in his mind of, oh, of course, backstage. <laughs> they're giving us, they're giving us the signal. It's time to go on. It's that sort of you know, flashing lights just at the side of the stage. It's his beginners. Uh, uh, it seems it seems so small in comparison to the horrors of the chorus before me, but absolutely, uh, I realise that. Uh, yeah, so then I kind of I galvanise. Can I see any of the other brothers? Are they because of the way the doors are located? You can only really see one, yeah. uh, the, the, and only just through the sort of initial door that you came in through. Right. Yeah, yeah. You can just see his silhouette in the doorway. The light is very very dim in here. I should have made that clear. It felt sepulchral. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. A couple of. A couple of torches is all. But yeah, you can see a silhouette in the doorway. Atmospheric lighting, very Jacobean, can't see a thing. So having seen the, the flash of light and seeing the silhouette in the door, I think that's enough. Yeah. I, th- I think you take that as your cue. Yeah. And you you place your hand on the symbol and begin speaking the words. Yeah. If they are words, making the sounds. Yes. As loudly as you dare, but as quietly as you feel, mm. you must. The words of power begin to pour out of me that I've been learning. And as you chant, you see this symbol that was sort of etched into the stone fill with blood. And it's not the blood in your hand, or perhaps it is, but it, it seems like an awful lot of blood. Mm. And, uh, and can you give me... Can you roll a d10, and that is the point of sanity points that you lose, that's the number of sanity points that you lose for casting this. Uh, Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. I'm going to go with the yellow die for this. Oh, six. That's a bout of madness. Wow, that certainly is. Okay. That's going to happen at the the culmination of this spell. Now, Robert, Mm. the last thing you see before everything goes black Mm. is this man dip a coin into this cup of blood and then he reaches out over the big hole that looks down into this cavern this huge sort of cistern and he drops it and you see the coin fall all the way through the room and down through a hole in the centre of the room and when it passes through that hole it's like suddenly the time sort of stops uh, and there's like a weird sort of seismic wave and you feel like you're falling into a dream and everything goes black for you sweet oblivion oblivion and Joseph let's see what happens to you you see this out of the corner of your eye you see this coin fall through the room and land right in the center somewhere down in in a hole in the center of the room mm. as like a coin dropped in a well mm. just like just like back in the um basilica just like that and you too feel this weird thing happen to to time or space or something and that the, the air in the room changes and you suddenly feel like you're outside it and there's some kind of shield, perhaps, protecting you. And then you're bound. <laughs> I can summarise yours as well. You're now on your own. I know that's good. How many magic points? Do you need some magic points from me? Oh, I, I do. Sorry. Uh, Just, you know, in case it's 24. Yes, yes. In which case I might be dead. Uh, no, it's, I mean, it's, it's basically, oh yeah, I should have told you this. It's basically as many as you're willing to spend, because the more you spend, 
the stronger this barrier will be that you've created. Oh God, I mean, probably then 14, I would have thought. I would do 14. That would leave me one left. Okay, I think that's sensible. A very high MP. Let's see how many points. So I'm going to... So, and there are five of you in total. So 14. I'm going to say the others spend 10 each, because maybe they're not quite as good as you. He's po- he's possibly the best character I've ever rolled, by the way. Wow. He's going to do him any good. And mine's the worst. Hmm. And yet, I was always terrified of you. <laughs> so you don't want to fight him. And would have basically done anything you said <laughs> from the moment I remembered who you were uh-huh. I was like shit I'll do anything he says uh-huh. I just don't want trouble <laughs> seven, nine, seven, nine. so true of the liberal elite isn't it yeah yeah afraid of violence afraid of what might hurt them <laughs> so 23 afraid, afraid of working well that's true Afraid of working class. So, this barrier, I'll tell you how much strength this barrier has. You've done a good job. You've done a good thing. Whatever happens next, you've done a good thing. This barrier has 1,472 points of strength. Oh, oh my God. Oh, this is, this is like proper gaming, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly. We've got 1,000 points. That's, is, is it going to make it? I think, I think it'll be all right. Fingers crossed. I don't know what the fuck they're, they're summoning. I need to roll you something on the uh, on the phobia table. Mm. Oh yeah. <laughs> so, as you're chanting, you realise that you forgot to put your blindfold on. <clears throat> Shit! Yes, I did. Fuck. No, that's true. Because <laughs> I've been looking at all of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and. You start to hear these these strange noises. You've nearly finished your minute of chanting. And uh, you you start counting down, you know, in, while you're chanting, you think, oh, you know, it's, it's probably 20 more seconds, probably 15 more seconds. And then suddenly you're like, what's going to happen at 13 seconds? You have developed an irrational fear of the number 13. <laughs> <laughs> what's going to happen at 13 seconds? And funnily enough, when when there are 13 seconds left, suddenly you see them emerging from this hole in the center of the room. Oh, no. A lot of creatures like the Orcolat, you know, they're twice the size of these humanoid creatures with no forehead and no nose and these foul mouths and they're crawling out. And and all, all the, the humanoid creatures, as soon as they see this, they turn to the doorways and run and you, you you see a couple of them run towards your your gateway if you like just as you finish chanting and they sort of slam into a a, a wall that isn't there and kind of bounce off it in, in pain and these orcalats whatever they are fall upon them tearing them ripping at them with their, their jaws and their hooves and then you see something else come out of the the pit, as it were. Oh, no. No. You see these enormous, black, hairy paws. Oh, God, no. And then a head, like nothing you've ever seen. The mouth is vertical down the centre with teeth that close vertically and pink eyes on stalks that come out the side of its head. Two of these come out and start mauling at the the Orcolats as well as the, the humanoid figures. Uh, and what unfolds is like a scene that a Hieronymus Bosch could not have painted. Like a vision of hell. And you're frantically trying to get like, your blindfold round your eyes. Yeah, yeah, exactly, of course. It's all too late, but yeah. But, but, like, thank fuck, all you can think about is the number 13. And how much worse the number 13 is than any of this. Yeah. Because in the middle of a bout, you're immune. It's, it's, it's all of this. It is 13 is all of this. This is 13. You glance up and you see that Julia's body is still hanging there, untouched by all of them. As this chaos unfolds and, and some of these bodies start getting dragged back down into the hole and, and some of the creatures come up and test test the strength of the barrier by your door. But it's far too, it's far too strong. They don't, 
make a dent in, in this invisible barrier. And as they walk around the room, sort of testing its strength, eventually the last of them gives up and crawls back into the hole. And all is still. And you see that some of the corpses are still hanging there and, and Julia is still suspended there, apparently unharmed. And you realise at last that in a way this was a like a, a a dish laid on for these creatures but more than anything it was a trap mm. what goes through your mind I, I, I think I think I feel like a, the spirit of Tontu is within me and that I've I've found a weird rejuvenation a weird enlightening I mean, of all of the spotlights to find myself in, I could never have imagined this one. But at last, I've made the transference from audience to performer. <laughs> and I've, I've crossed the forbidden line. And I think in that moment, I, I sort of... I, I look around for Robert, and I, I, I can't see him. But can I see my, my, my brethren as, as I think of them? Even in this moment, I think I think of them in that way. Because we're sort of bonded by this moment of, of the binding. Yeah. You can see them all through their own archways. Are they all having sort of similar reactions of... You realise that they are all wearing their blindfolds. Yeah. Uh, okay. In which case, I think... How, how high up is... Jude? Am I, am I back in myself? Am I no longer suffering my bout of madness? Who knows? But I think in, in, my, in my instincts, I want to try and save Julia. Mm. And I and I, I think I'm whispering under my breath, Robert, Robert, can you hear me? I'm going to try and save Julia. And do you do you try and run through the the archway? Ah, uh, yeah. I think I do. You take sort of one step and you're thrown back, and your body is racked with pain. The wow. And you pass out. Sharon Clifford. Yeah. You wake up on uh, a bench in an airport lounge. Well, I say a bench. It's sort of three seats bolted together. I think you've managed just maybe a couple of fitful hours sleep. Um, you are clutching... Clutching the suitcase. Yes, exactly. In one hand and in the other, a plane ticket for a plane early that morning. And memories come back to you in reverse order, perhaps. You remember lying down on this bench you remember going and buying your ticket asking for the first flight out of here you seem to remember you were in some kind of state you remember getting a taxi here and then something strange happened last night but can you remember or you may be trying not to trying to force those memories deep down but either way you uh, you check the time, check the time on your ticket, and it's uh, it's nearly time to board. That is okay. <laughs> so you make your way to the check-in desk. Yeah. And that morning you are you're at the you're at the check-in desk, and who do you see? Who do you see in front of you, but Don and Julia? No, no. What? What? I don't know whether you speak to them or... Yes, 100%. I think, I think I immediately, you know, I, by this point, Sharon is a, she's a physical wreck. <laughs> she hasn't washed in a couple of days. She's sweaty. She's been underground. She's dirty. Mm. There's probably tear stains and, you know, I mean, who knows what other kind of stains happened in the flight from flight down the hill. I think she'll, she'll sort of grab grab onto the back of Don and Julia's coat and just say, and just say, Don, Julia, you you're all right, you're all right, you're here. They they jump and turn round as if as if they've seen a ghost. <laughs> uh, Don says, "Oh my God, you you are uh, you're getting out of here as well." I see. Yeah. What what happened, Julia? Are you all right? We, we were so worried about you. Where did you? Like, where did you go? I... I, I don't know. I, 
I, I think maybe... Uh, I, I'm not sure. I, it's just... I'm very confused. I just need to get home. Yeah. Are you feeling all right? And Don says, it's okay. It's okay. Don't don't worry, Julia. She, um... She thinks maybe someone spiked her drink or something. Oh, my God. Yeah, we need to get out of here. This place isn't right. Yeah, I was out looking for her all night. I got back and, um... There she was in our room. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, I'm just so... I'm, I'm so relieved you're all right. Yes. I... D- uh, Don wanted to speak to the police, and uh, but I just, I just want to go home. I, I just need to be at home. I'm, yeah, me too. I, I need, I need, I need to. And she puts her hand on her abdomen, and she says, "I need to think of the baby." Oh, congratulations! We, we did wonder. Congratulations. And they both look at you a bit oddly when you say we did wonder. You sort of get the feeling that maybe something's changed between them. You can't tell what. Mm. And just the last thing I'd like you to do before you check in and, um, and and go through to the gate, could you give me a spot hidden? Yes. 41 on a 45. Oh, the rolling's been good. Wow. Incredible rolling at the end of that. Wow rolling. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If only, it was, uh, if only it was going so well for the guys. La, 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 la. So... Somehow, mm-hmm. as you see them pass their passports over to the desk, I think you've, you've kept close with them as you've continued this conversation and you see Don hand his passport over, Donald Benson, and then you see Julia put hers down and you realise she's not Julia Benson. Her name is Julia Marlowe. They're, um... I don't know whether she hasn't changed her name yet or maybe, maybe they're not even married. But maybe you... Just let that go without bringing it up. Yeah, I think I think it's a point of interest, but I think at that moment, I just let it go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And the three of you get on that flight back to London. Oh, my God. And uh, well, you, this is just something you have to live with. <laughs> don't know whether you, uh, you ever... Uh, Think about what happened to poor old um, Nicholas and Robert and Niccolo, who you didn't see when you got back to the house. There's no sign of him or his mother. Well, I think Sharon's a very practical human being, and I think I think what she'll what she'll agree within herself is that she'll just we'll just forget this. We're just going to forget this happened. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and the, the party line is. I was I wasn't feeling very well and I wanted to come home so I just came home early. And that's what you tell Martin and Lucy. And that's what I tell Martin and Lucy. Brilliant. But I, I am a little bit sad that I never learnt the authentic spaghetti bolognese. <laughs> no, I think well you just go back to uh, Sainsbury's and uh, get in a jar. I Sainsbury's think... in the 70s? Yeah. I don't know. Safeway? Safeway. <laughs> yeah, there we go. You go back to your jar your your jar of spag ball from Safeway and I think you're very happy. And I think maybe Sharon Sharon's travelling dreams brief was a brief flame that was extinguished immediately. She never leaves well it's this evening, but she never leaves the county again. Yeah, Brian was right after all. <laughs> Brian was right! Nicholas and Robert, sometime later, both of you wake up in what appear to be hospital beds, in some sort of religious institution. You can hear people bustling about speaking in Italian, and as you open your eyes, you notice that you're being cared for by, by, by an order of nuns, in a big stone building and as you start to come to out of your state of sleep or unconsciousness you feel almost like you could be in one of those Sid Long non-sploitation films from the beginning of the decade whatever happened to Sid Long probably best not to think about that right now Robert someone comes over to your bed and says Ah, Signor Hyde. Yes? You are a very, a very ill man. Well, what's your point? (laughs) 
Do you wish to... Are you a religious man? Would you like to have some time with a priest or... No, thank you. I've, I've had my fill of religion. We can hear confession or give you some peace in your last days. What do you mean, last days? This is it, is it? Mr. Hyde, I think you know your cancer has progressed quite severely. Right. So what you're saying is it's now. It's happening now. Is there anybody we should call, Mr. Hyde? No. I don't think so. Oh. Phone, um, or write to Lionel, Lionel Beckman. He'll need to know. He'll know what to do. Very good. We will stay with you. You, you will not be alone, Mr. Hyde. Yeah, well, thanks very much. Cigarette? She picks a bowl up from next to your bed on, like, the sort of, you know, bedside table mm. and says, Oh, I see you uh, managed to eat something this morning. That's good. I hope it was to your taste. Well, <laughs> nothing tastes much of anything anymore, I'll be honest. But it went down all right. I suppose. Of course. That's good. And, uh, of course, we were careful to respect your uh, dietary requirements. And she smiles, a sort of forced smile. And she glances down at your hand, where, of course, you're wearing that signet ring. Mm. And Nicholas, on the other side of the ward, you open your eyes and you you see that your your hands are are, are bound to the side of your bed. Mm. You're 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 flexing your fingers and you can see that from where you are the the deep scars in the centre of both hands from where you cut them and blood under all your nails as if you've been sc scratching violently. Mm. And your body is still racked with pain. Wow. And you look up and there's a, there's a, there's a number. There's like a tag on the end of your bed. <clears throat> You're in bed number 13. No! no! This was an Apocalypse Players production. Sharon Clifford was played by Jeannie Spark. Robert Hyde by Dominic Allen. Nicholas Devere by Joseph Chance. With additional voices by Dan and McAleer, Joseph Tweedale and Samuel Bibby. The Keeper of Arcane Law was Dan Wheeler. For more information, visit apocalypseplayers.com. To support the podcast and receive exclusive horrors in return, you can join the Cult of the Apocalypse at patreon.com forward slash apocalypse players.
Within the moments before that scream, as I see the number 13, I realize the whole journey has made an awful kind of sense. Maybe perhaps the superstitious people and numbers are important. Within this moment, I pitch into wild, terrified screaming. It all makes sense. I was led there to a place grieving the death of my dog, seeking sustenance, just like the creatures that were drawn from beneath into that trap. And I feel the echo and I see the connection between myself and them. And in that moment, I realize how lost I am. And that I've always been this cancerous commenter, commentator upon culture, not a creator of it. And yet in joining the ritual, for the first time ever, I dared to cross into the liminal space of the performer. And I put my hand upon that egg-like orb with its tentacular sweeping trails away from it. Of course, I created this force that I then hurt myself upon because I did not understand it. And it is all wrapped up in the power of this number. The number that is beyond understanding. The 13. It makes the brain work. Like a great piece of theatre should make the brain work. And yet how much it corrupts, how much it bends and twists the psyche. And it all coheres again to this moment of sense. And just before I pass out from my screaming, I feel that horrified connection. And I feel the weird hope that maybe, just maybe, there is a way to make Tontu live again. To make all of us live again in the secret shadows beneath the earth. And then I pass out.